Welcome back, Cap Nation. I'm Marty Emino, along with Assistant Communication Directors Dan Schofield and Tony Regina. And our special guest today on Zoom is Brandon Matthews. Brandon, we know, is a longtime Gap competitor, a multiple-time major winner, and recently made a name for himself for all the right reasons. He's currently got full status on the Latin American tour, and he's at his home in Florida, obviously hunkered down with the pandemic. And, and Brandon, how are things? Is everybody well? And uh, you know, how are you keeping your game sharp uh, nowadays? Yeah, uh, you know, tough time in the world um, right now. Um, you know, fortunately, my uh, club down here, Turtle Creek Club, still open. Um, oh. Just talking only. Uh, social distancing protocol in place with, you know, leave the pin and we have a little um, foam thing that kind of prevents the ball from going going into the hole so you don't have to touch the pin or hole or anything like that. And we're staying far away from each other. So, um, you know, that's it's nice. We're, we're very, very fortunate down here to – be able at least to get outside and kind of keep the mind at ease a little bit with, um, you know, I know back up in PA, it's been a tough go for the last uh, month or so. So, um, yeah. you know, we're, we're very fortunate down here and, um, you know, just trying to stay as safe as possible. Great. So uh, we'll take it down memory lane, memory lane a little bit. Uh, let's start with kind of some gaffic accomplishments and then we'll work our way into what you're currently doing. Uh, and all the good stuff that's going on with you. So, so what do you remember from the 2013 kind of Open Championship? We know you won a junior championship in 11, won the Silver Cross in 12, uh, but 13, you really made your mark. You won the Patterson Cup that year, um, and then the Open, or I guess the Open and then the Patterson Cup. So what do you remember about the Open and your playoff with Billy Stewart? Yeah, 13 was a really special year. I, I, I played really nice um, – basically the entire duration of the year uh, from spring all the way through the fall. Um, you know, I, I remember, uh, I mean, Waynesboro is such a great track. I love that place. Um, I remember coming up the last few holes and kind of stumbling a little bit coming in and realizing, wow, I actually need to birdie the last of the year in order to force a playoff. And, um, you know, I blocked my tee ball right into the trees and um, my buddy Devin Bebo, who also went to Temple, was uh, chatting for me at the time. He's like, all right, you can just try to, like, play something a little low here and try to scoot it up around the green, try to chip it in. I said, no. I said, there's a little window up there in the tree. It was about, you know, I mean, it was a small window. And I hit this little cut 56 up through it to 10 feet. And I, I could not get a putt to the whole entire back nine. And I just made sure I kind of – accelerated through that one and uh, got into the playoff and played pretty nicely in the playoff there, the, at those four holes. So I was able to pull it, pull it out. Yeah, I know Tony's got a question, but I'll hop in here. I guess I, I buried the lead there. That was after your U S open uh, excitement, you know, where you became an alternate at Marion. Um, unfortunately did not draw into the field, but you got a lot of exposure, you know, that week in June, I know golf channel did a little spot on you uh, maybe more than one if I remember correctly. But what was that like, uh, you know, at Marion, even though you were an alternate and didn't make the field, just being, you know, at the site of a major championship in your own backyard? Obviously, it would have been incredible um, to play in that championship. But um, the experiences um, that I learned, the, the, the way I looked at that whole experience that I went through at Marion, was that I could play with those guys. Um, just being around the practice facilities and watching some of these guys um, go through their routines and practice and hit shots and this, and I kind of stepped back and uh, watched the guys hit some shots. And I was like, I can do this. I can, I can hit those shots. I can, I'm just as good as these guys. And um, that kind of gave me the confidence to run through the year and play really well. Based on that remark, Brandon, uh, that flipped the switch with me. When in your mind did you decide that professional golf was the career you certainly wanted to pursue? When I was 12. Oh, okay, that early. Okay. What, uh, what flipped the switch at age 12? What assured you that, hey, this is the direction I want to head in? I've always been highly competitive with um, – a few different sports, you know, I was big into baseball growing up, played a ton of that. And when I kind of, when I set baseball aside and solely focused on 
golf. Uh, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I specifically remember going to get my first ever lesson um, at 12 years old. And uh, my first ever instructor, John Bode, um, I was walking up to um, the lesson tee and he said, Brandon, what are your aspirations? I said, I want to play on the PGA Tour. And he said, okay, well, we have something to work with. And, you know, my, um, I, I believe my work ethic really has propelled me to um, the places that I've been fortunate enough to get to. And you know, I, I believe that my work ethic is also going to propel me um, beyond that. And, uh, you know, as long as I stay healthy, I believe sky's the limit. Age 12. I don't know that Marty. I thought I thought he you were talking about Marion and just being reassured where your game was at after seeing the professionals out there at Marion that week at the US Open. I thought you were gonna say that kind of uh reinforced your decision. I didn't realize you had your mind made up at age twelve. Uh, my goal at age my goal at age twelve was to work with Tony Regina and it happened. So I mean <laughs> <laughs> miracles don't cease. My goal at age twelve was to win a little league championship, I think. All right. And I think we did because six year yeah. sixth grade was my best year of baseball, Marty. Side note. Okay. Side note. Well, let's look at <laughs> let's uh, let's let's complete 2013 quickly. I'll just run off a, a couple of things and just get a, a comment from you, Brandon, on uh, the Patterson Cup. So that year, in addition to almost you know being a U.S. Open alternate, uh, you won the Gap Open, you won the Gap Patterson Cup, the Gap Silver Cross, and you were U.S. Amateur quarter finalist that year. Lost to Ali Goss up, up at Brookline. Uh, and then obviously um, with all those accolades came the gap player of the year uh, that year. So just uh, let's just touch on the Patterson cup there a minute. You shot a course record 65 in the final round, six under 65 at Cedarbrook. Um, and it was that the year, if I remember correctly, you basically won and hopped in the car to go to the U S amateur. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what happened. Uh, uh, what do you remember about that Patterson cup? Um, you know, Cedarbrook's usually pretty, challenging golf course at times um and obviously you played great yeah for some reason cedarbrook um just really fits my eye like every single shot on that golf course I, it just very very uh easy on me uh visually um so for me um very comfortable golf course um felt comfortable the first second night i stepped on the tee there um the first round i remember um that I really didn't make anything. And I kind of, I remember getting off the golf course that day going, God, I think I shot 69 if I remember right. And um, after I shot that 69, I'm like, God, I mean, I can, I can go out and shoot nothing on this golf course. So I just made a couple putts tomorrow. And I went out and, um, you know, kind of got things rolling and um, was fortunate enough to um, go out there and shoot 65. And like you said, Marty, hopped in the car to Brookline, you went. What do you remember about the Brookline experience immediately thereafter? That was awesome. I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, have my coach, Brian Quinn, on the bag for um, the qualifying rounds there. Um, he really kept me in the moment um, going through those two rounds and felt really good about my game um, going into it and I really thought I could compete. It's, you know, I, I remember the, the biggest thing I remember is sitting in that hotel room before the night before the quarterfinals going, I'm two matches away from the Masters, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> you know, which was, which was a pretty cool thought um, there to have. Um, and I remember, I think, I think Steve Burkowski called me that night and we were talking about that a little bit. It was, uh, it was just pretty cool to be in that moment, have the opportunity to, uh, win such a prestigious, prestigious title. I think that match was televised, Marty. Uh, I, I would they, imagine. Yeah, yeah I would they, imagine. they televised it. Yeah. So I would, I would think then, Brandon, after that year, um, not only competing and dominating kind of the gap landscape, but playing with the big boys, they probably had a, a good vibe that, you know, your professional career was dead ahead of you. Yeah. Um, you know, very, very fortunate for everything that's really happened um, over the last few years, even, you know, even the lows, because, you know, I've, I've, I've built off of the lows. I've um, unfortunately had some injuries and, 
you know, I really felt like I played really good golf for the majority of my amateur and professional career, except for, you know, a uh, three month stretch really. Uh, this past summer of 2019. And um, unfortunately in professional golf, a little three month lull in your game can kind of derail you a little bit. So unfortunately that's what happened, but it, it kind of made me stronger in the back end of realizing, okay, well, you got to work that much harder to get back to where you need to be. So uh, I thought that was a, a, a great learning experience for me. Um, and, you know, I mean, bottom line of it all is, you know, hard work always pays off. So. Well, we'll uh, we can skip the rest of kind of the gap accolades. We know you won the open in 2015, but let's get to where you are currently and what, and, you know, kind of how you got there. Um, you turned professional in October 2016, I believe? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, got onto the Latin American tour. I've had a little success out there. You know, how is it really for me? My question would be, you know, how difficult is it going to kind of a foreign country where maybe they don't even speak English, you know, or English is a second language? Dealing with that kind of um, those kind of circumstances and then trying to bring your A, golf, a game to guys who are all trying to kind of, you know, work their way up the ladder. Yeah, I mean, it really matures you quickly. Um, you know, as a 22 or 23, 22 and 23 year old, basically, I think I was 22. I remember right when I first got out there. And, you know, being 22 when, you, when you're first kind of dipping your feet in the water is a little scary because you got to book your own travel, you got to do this, you got to do that. I never mm -hmm. really that before and um especially going to some of these places where we went to um realizing uh, um, that you know sometimes you can't really veer too far off of the resort that you're staying at so um but it, it was a great learning experience um there's great talent down there the um entire pga tour latino america staff is I mean, I can't tell you how good of a job that they do in helping us. And I mean, they, they are really incredible people. Um, but, you know, um, I went down there and I was fortunate enough to play really well out of the gate. Um, you know, I was leading the first event, ended up winning the second event. Um, and I think I was third on the money list at the halfway point. And then I came back. And that's kind of when I got injured there with my back. So um, that was a tough pill to swallow there because, um, you know, with having my back injury, I was having a couple experiences where I'd get out of a car and fall down. And, you know, at 23 years old, that's not something that, you know, anyone usually deals with. So at 23 to be going through that was very, very frustrating. Um, and, you know, to come back from that took a lot of work and, um, you know, with the injury being in early September, I think it was, um, my only goal was to get ready for Q school. I was fortunate enough to play well enough in the first half to get, um, into final stage, um, because of the first cutoff. I was 10th. I was right on the edge. I finished 10th at the first cutoff for Q school. So um, my goal was to make sure that I can get my game ready for final state and be healthy enough to play at least so I can get some status. And um, I worked, I mean, I worked so hard. I did everything um, you could possibly imagine to make sure that I was healthy and um, I made a deadline for myself sometime in November, forgetting exactly where it was. Um, I think it was right about a month before. I really didn't hit a golf shot in, you know, uh, a solid just over two months. And I tried a couple times, but my, my leg would just kind of, kind of collapse from underneath me. And um, it was like a couple days before I set my deadline. And... I hit this one shot and my leg collapses again. I'm like, well, that's it. My my deadline's a couple couple days away here. I, I don't I don't know what I'm gonna do. So, but I continued to do what I 
was doing, you know, um, just hiking, going to the chiropractor. I was on a table, uh, whether it was PT or chiropractor, for three hours a day. And um, the deadline day hit, and my dad said, come on, let's, let's go try this. Let's see if you can swim. And I went up and hit a shot with no pain. And um, that's when I said, okay, well, I'm not going to push this. So I got back down to Florida, continued with all my uh, treatment and everything like that. And um, within a week, I was hitting balls and um, somehow managed to get my game good enough to make it through uh, final stage. Jeez. That's crazy. Yeah, I didn't know you had that many physical issues going into yeah. it. Yeah. Earlier in, uh, in the season there, you did get your first professional win on, uh, I think it was at the Molina. And that made you the youngest American winner on the Latino tour at the time. Just talk about the, the breakthrough there and, and the confidence that gave you moving forward despite the injuries. Uh, God, I, I felt comfortable out there. Um, you know, I th think, I think the biggest round of golf that um, I played in my professional career was the first round that I played on PGA tour Latino America. Um, I went out in Bogota and shot 10 under, I think, the first round I played. And that, <laughs> and that gave me um, kind of like just the confidence to go, all right, I, I, I should be winning out here. I, I need to – this is where I need to be. I'm going to keep progressing, keep progressing, keep progressing. And, um, you know, so unfortunately I didn't get that win the first event. But the event right afterwards, I had, I had such confidence going into it because I knew I could do it. Uh, um, I went into that and just played really solid golf um, and just had all the confidence in the world. Good stuff. Ten under. <laughs> that, that, that gives you enough confidence. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then you, from there, you had full web.com tour status, right, in 18, I guess yeah. that was? 18 and 19. So um, 2018, I had a really nice first half of the year again. Um, there was a few, you know, I mean, a shot here and a shot there, I'm in the top 25. I think I was 42nd at the halfway point. Um and just a really solid first half. In the second half, I, I, I remember it. I remember it was, it was the, um, the event and rally, the, the Rex Hospital Open. And I was going into it, and at the beginning of the week, I remember I've never been more confident going into an event. Uh, I was coming off of three top tens in a row, I think, or something like that. And... I just felt like I was going to win that week. And um, I hit a couple bad shots coming down the stretch in the second day. I uh, had uh, a bad break or two where I lost a golf ball where I shouldn't have. And from then on, I started pressing a little bit with my game where, you know, I should have maybe played the next week, see how it went and taken a week off or something like that to rest. I just kept pressing it the entire year back end of it and I ended up finishing 82nd on the money list um, just missing the playoffs so that taught me how valuable rest was for me um, especially with you know the injury that I went through the previous year um, to be able to give myself uh, enough time to recover and give my body a break is it's something that you don't think about because at that point, you know, I'm 23, 24 years old. And I mean, you just, you think you're invincible. You know what I mean? You, you don't think injury is not a factor, right? I mean, like you just don't think about it. So, um, you know, that was a valuable lesson for me and, you know, carrying it over in the next, into the next few years. Last year, I just, I just had a really bad three months. I went into a little bit of a slump. Um, and just didn't play good for three months. Uh, again, kept pressing and pressing. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, last year was a situation where I had to play that amount of events. And I realize now that no matter what the circumstance, 
I need to give my body a break and kind of recover it in order to be at the level that I need to be at to compete out there. Important lesson learned. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and then obviously a, a moment that most people watching this have, have seen, uh, the, v, the Visa Open uh, in November, I believe. Um, you're on, you're on in a playoff, you're on the green and, and you hit the putt and then the, the viral uh, feel good moment that follows suit. Can you, can you take us through your mindset and just kind of the timeline of the events that transpired? Yeah. I mean, first of all, Rico hit an amazing putt. He, he played all, really well the entire week. You know, I hit a, I hit a great shot in there the, in the third playoff hole. Um, hit it right at the pin, just spun a little left. I had an eight footer up the hill. He rolls in a 25, 30 footer from just off the green on the back. Um, so I get over it. I was putting really well the entire week. Um, and I just had, I had no doubts that, I mean, I was going to make it. I, I was, I was just hitting every one of my lines and it was just feeling really good. And, you know, in that situation, um, you know, it's just really, really silent. Um, so with that much silence, even the smallest sounds get amplified a little bit. And unfortunately, um, you know, the, the, I don't even want to call it a scream. The noise came at the wrong time in my putting stroke. And I kind of just, you know, I was, I was just transitioning, gave it a little right hand and missed it low left. Um, obviously frustrated at that point because, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking that someone um, tried to make me miss that putt at that point. Um, you know, so I was very disappointed with what was on the line with the British Open and so on and so forth at the time. And um, just kind of in a little bit of shock. And then I went inside and uh, Claudio came in, the tournament director, and kind of explained to me the whole deal. And that's when I, I mean, I knew at that point, obviously, it wasn't intentional. So I uh, just wanted to go out and, and uh, find Wanchi and just make sure that he was um, not upset at himself or anything like that. I just wanted to make sure he was he was in a place where um, he understood um, that there was no hard feelings and uh, just want to make sure he was a fan of golf uh, for life. Were you, were you shocked by the response? I mean, you were, you were on SportsCenter, one big thing. You were – you were going viral over the place. So how did that feel from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, the best example I can give you is, you know, I, I, as soon as I got done um, seeing Wanchi and everything like that, and I got back from the crowd and was going back in the locker room. My, my, my good friend, Matt Ryan, um, who I, I've played with the last few years, on, uh, we kind of both bounced back and forth um, a little bit on the tours, and we play a lot of golf together. Um, He said, that's going to go a long way. I said, we're in Buenos Aires. I said, I just did it to make the guy feel good. Like, we're, like this isn't going anywhere from here. Like, I just want to make sure the guy felt good. And um, Matt goes, no, you believe me, this is going to pick up. I said, Matt, it's not going to pick up. So, you know, the next morning um, when I landed, uh, got a call from my agent that um, I believe golf – Digest was the first uh, outlet to pick it up, if I remember right. And then um, it just kind of escalated from there. There was I, I was getting phone calls the entire day, um, and then I, it was just crazy. It was um, it was it was a pretty crazy day. I never expected any of it. Just um, you know, I, I'm thankful that I was able to show people how simple it is to make someone happy and make a little bit of a difference. So uh, take us uh, take us to the moment when you got the phone call that you got the sponsor exemption or the exemption into uh, into the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Yeah, so I was actually out on a little golf trip um, with a couple of buddies, and um, you know it was crazy. Uh, it, my agent calls me and he's trying to like make conversation first. I'm like Drew, what what do you, what, what do you <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what are you trying to tell me? He goes, yeah, that was pretty bad. All right, you're in the Arnold Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it was it, it was a great, um, great moment, great day. Um, 
but you know, from after that day, it was really, you know, head down, make sure, you know, you're preparing the right way, um, doing everything because obviously, you know, that opportunity had, um, the potential to be extremely life-changing and I wanted to make sure I was as ready as possible um, and you know the first day I actually played some really good golf um, the thing that killed me the, the entire week is I didn't make a single putt outside of five feet um, which mm. we're not going to <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, you know, so the first day it was a, honestly, it was, it was a 69 turned into a 75, um, with some, some putts and, uh, one or two breaks that really were suspect. And, um, the second day kind of went out early and, um, just kind of started pressing a little bit, um, bogey the first two holes and then, you know, really took the pedal down to the floor, trying to press even more. And it just kind of went the other way, unfortunately. Um, but the greatest thing about that experience is I learned um, some weaknesses in my game where I need to improve um, and just realize, you know, what it, what it, I, I realized what it actually takes, the effort that needs to be put in the uh, correct effort in the right areas. You know, you always hear the, um, the phrase practice smarter, not harder. And that week really taught me that uh, how valuable that statement actually is. Because, you know, you can, you can be out there hitting a thousand eight irons a day with really no purpose. You're not going to get that much better. Um, you might see small strides but you're not going to get to the level that you want doing that so you know being able to practice in certain ways to really truly um get your game in a place where it's ready to succeed and play at the highest level is is the biggest thing that i learned from that what was the last event you played in the arnold palmer invitational that was the last event okay hmm. have they given you guys any time frame when you're going to come back is it the same as the tour um, we apparently are getting notified in the next, uh, couple of weeks to what the plan of attack is. Um, okay. you know, unfortunately, you know, PGA tour Latino America isn't something that's going to be televised that people want to see. So, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're kind of on the, um, on the, on the back burner a little bit as far as decision making, which is completely understood. So, um, you know, I, the, from what I understand, the main parts of the player meeting was just make sure, you know, the PJ Tour champions and Corn Ferry Tour, the main three tours that they have are, um, you know, all taken care of. And then, mm -hmm. you know, for us, you know, we have the, – the tough part for us is we had a uh, – we've had a split schedule on PJ Tour Latino America um, for however long. So uh, they're changing that to a wraparound season. They were supposed to at the end of this year. Mm. So I think that has um, a big thing to do with why it's a little bit delayed. They need to figure out whether, you know, we're going to continue to do that wraparound season, when we, whether we're just going to cancel this year altogether. I, I really don't know what's going to happen. I haven't even heard a little bit of anything, no rumors, no nothing. So um, we're just going to have to see. You get home at all? Uh, mostly summer. I'm, uh, I'm kind of getting soft when it comes to cold weather. Anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, we all are, but we're stuck. Uh, <laughs> um, I am very, very fortunate to, um, be able to be a member at uh, the country club of Scranton, which, uh, in my opinion, is one of the best golf courses in the entire Northeast. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I, I try to get back there as much as I possibly can. Um, Excuse me. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to pass up, you know, a couple of weeks playing that place a year at least. So uh, I try to get up there as much as I can in the summer, especially with travel. Uh, it's sometimes a little easier when the last couple of years is I was on Corn Ferry to go back, um, back home to Northeast Pennsylvania in order to practice on the grasses that I'm going to be playing in the summer instead of, you know, coming back down to Florida and practice on Bermuda and then going 
to play in, you know, uh, you know, Victoria National where it's all that grass, you know, something like that. So, um, so did that a lot in the summer. Um, I'll probably be back up this summer for at least a few weeks. Um, I'll visit, I, I usually visit Philly for, you know, a week or two at a time. And it's, um, you know, I mean, there's such, such good golf up there. Such good, I love coming back. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, anything else? You're good? Yeah, I think I think the uh, concluding question should be this being gap on Zoom. Um, what it, if you could sum it up just in a few sentences, what it, what is gap and all the success you had in the uh, in the gap region uh, mean to you now looking back on it? Well, I think that was a huge stepping stone in my career. Um, the level of talent in the Golf Association of Philadelphia is pretty incredible. Um, you know, no matter who you are, I mean, you have to really step up and play some good golf to win a tournament there. Um, he gave me the confidence to sell at higher levels. And, um, you know, I can't thank every one of you and beyond enough for the opportunity that you guys gave me in order to. to do. Thanks for taking some time today. Uh, say hi to everybody for us. And hopefully uh, next time you're up in the area, please stop by and, and say hi. Absolutely. I appreciate it more than you can imagine, guys. Thanks for having me on. Great. Thanks, Brendan. Have a great one. <laughs>